But I think um, some institutions really had a positive impact. And now looking back at what they did during the remote era and what they were able to bring to life, um, it might be quite interesting to see what they can learn from the change process itself and how they could use um, those insights for further change uh, management in their organization. And that's exactly um, what we'll look into now. And for that, um, we'll come to a speaker, as I promised in my last session already, who comes from a country that usually the rest of Europe looks up to in awe because they're really advanced when it comes to digitalization in all areas, not only education, but also the healthcare system. Um, so I'm very excited to have her here today. Welcome, Anna Beitane. Thank you so much. And um, to reveal the obvious, Anna Beitane is a manager of online learning projects at the Chase Kitt Institute of Political Studies at the University of Tartu, Estonia, the country I was referring to. Um, she's also the author of several multidisciplinary MOOCs and the recipient of the Hista Ecos Quality Mark Label Award. And she'll now um, tell us um, the change management learnings they unearthed at their very own organization that they think might be valuable for other organizations as well. The stage is yours, Anna. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for this very nice uh, introduction. And uh, well, I have to say that now I feel a little bit of a pressure having such a great introduction. And uh, I'll try to deliver on, uh, on the promise, on the digital promise. Uh, if I can just, uh, OK, sorry, just a small technical hurdle. But that's a classic. Uh, so. Thank you so much once again for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Anna Betana. I'm a manager of online learning projects at Johann Schutt Institute of Political Studies in Estonia. And today, indeed, I'm going to talk a little bit about the change management. Um, I think all of us can remember very vividly March of 2020 and the drastic change of how our respective universities had to readjust to new circumstances. So uh, I believe that the following situation certainly highlighted that in order to do it in a sustainable way, any higher education institution needs to make sure that there is a clear roadmap of how teaching staff and support staff need to be retrained in the new circumstances to bridge the digital gap of learners uh, and, of course, to make sure that the digital infrastructure is also put in place. And last but not least, of course, to ensure quality uh, when it comes to implementation of new teaching activities in the digital format. But the purpose of this talk today is, of course, uh, well, not to go through this memory lane and the horrors of uh, COVID that uh, presented us with, but to rather take you on an uh, imaginary uh, journey with me and to shape, showcase with you uh, our case study. So basically how we managed uh, the changes, how we readjusted our teaching activities in the light of COVID. And since the purpose of today's, well purpose, and, or rather theme of, uh, of the festival open for discussion, I'm also pretty much looking forward to your questions and comments. It's rather our idea. So nothing is written on, on stone. I'm very excited to, to read your comments and questions and hear your also opinion about the steps that we have taken. And well, again, uh, you might say, Anna, this is great, of course, but why should we necessarily care about the case study of the University of Tartu and Johann Schutt Institute of Political Studies? Well, it's, as it was already mentioned before, the country where I come from, Estonia, or E-Estonia, if you wish, uh, the digitalization and e-solutions are not something new. And uh, basically, the, the first principles of Estonian e-governance were laid out in legislative framework going back to 1994. And by 2001, we already had X-Road, basically the digital infrastructure that ensures all the e-services. So basically, in a nutshell, you can do pretty much everything online, except getting sagen? married, divorced, and uh, divorced, and getting your house. So 
because it's generally believed that uh, basically uh, for the important events in your life, you should turn up in person. But nevertheless, uh, why do I believe that it's also important to mention Johann Schutt Institute of Political Studies is that we managed to uh, develop, uh, as we believe, a scalable solution or rather a model of reorganization of studies for remote teaching and learning, taking into account various stakeholders, the teaching staff, management, and of course, students. And in this regard, I cannot help it, help it since I'm coming from academic uh, environment. I also believe that it's important a little bit to set up the context. So since we're talking about reorganization and changes that took place, it's also important to understand the context. So basically the DNA of the organization when we're talking about reorganizing it or moving the state of frame of mind when it comes to remote teaching and learning. And also to understand relevant stakeholders who are taking decisions, how the decision making takes place, etc. So I will take a little detour from the case study, but I think it's very important to set up the context so it's a little bit clear later on to understand to what exactly I'm referring to. And this is basically a short kind of overview of how University of Tartu is organized. Uh, we are a rather mid-sized university speaking in the European context. We have around 30,000 students enrolled in various degree programs and uh, around uh, 3,000 uh, staff members. And of course, uh, the main decision-making body of the University of Tartu is the Council. We also have the Senate, which is another decision-making body of the university when it comes to uh, research and academic affairs. And then, of course, we have the Rector's Office with the Vice Director of Academic Affairs that coordinates the overall flow and coordination uh, of teaching activities. And then when it comes to the structure of the university itself, we have faculties, we have four of them at the University of Tartu, and the institute to which I belong to belongs to the Faculty of Social Sciences. And within the faculties, we have the subunits, the institutes, uh, schools and colleges, and these respective institutes also have heads of the institute and uh, directors, uh, vice directors for academic affairs, plus support staff that assists with uh, teaching and management of teaching, like myself, manager of online learning projects. So later on, when I'm going to be talking about reorganization of studies, just simply take this mental screenshot and bear with me when I will be talking about uh, that later on. And of course, very briefly about the role of e-learning. So I have to say that even before the pandemic, e-learning was not something new. Uh, our university had a lifelong learning strategy. And uh, if you look at the chart, the number of e-courses that we have been developing at the university, either with the partial uh, e-learning support or full online support was quite significant. Uh, and when it comes to organization of e-learning in general, I have to um, point out that it is rather decentralized structure. What does it mean? It means that if one institute wants to be more proactive and do more MOOCs and e-courses, this respective unit is more than welcome to develop these courses. And in this regard, our institute uh, is quite proactive. So things like Zoom and innovative teaching was not something new that we learned in, in, in 2020. So uh, just a few words about some key definitions that I will talk about. Uh, basically, when I talk about reorganization, it would mean that I'm talking uh, predominantly about the rearrangement of our teaching practices, the tools that we use, the learning spaces. And um, another important definition here is remote teaching. I use it deliberately, uh, actually in academic 
or scholarly literature, it's even uh, became uh, an important term to use kind of remote, emergency remote teaching. And in this regard, I will differentiate these two types of uh, teaching modes, not referring to online teaching because it requires more thorough and more prepared approach in, in this regard. Um, DigiComp Edu, in this regard, I will use later on when I will introduce you to our mo model. And of course, this is a digital competence framework for educators developed by the European Commission that measures digital uh, skills of educators. And the last slide before I move on, I just wanted to, again, uh, differentiate several positions like educational technologist and instructional designer, because very often these terms are intertwined when we talk about reorganization, when we talk about uh, remote studies, this, these are quite crucial uh, positions. And when it comes to educational technologists, it's not necessarily an IT person. It's rather a person who is able to look at the didactics and integrate e-learning technologies into the classroom. And then instructional designer is a person who is helping teaching staff with uh, didactics, with designing their uh, Moodle pages or pages of uh, learning management systems. And then the digital task force, this is a, just a, a short abbreviation for our working group that we have established at Jochen Schutte Institute uh, that consisted of the uh, deputy director of academic affairs and myself when we uh, started the process of reorganization. So with that rather <laughs> long introduction, I'm finally happy to share with you our case study. I think it was important to set up this context so later on uh, it's a little bit more clear uh, what for you to follow what exactly we have done in this slide. And our process of reorganization, uh, I divided into six uh, stages. And the process, the process of reorganization started rather early on. So it started in uh, May of 2020, and it started with the establishment of our digital task force, or a kind of informal group that consisted of myself and the deputy head the director for academic affairs, exactly to make sure that we're able to digest all the relevant information that came from the central office and communicate this information to our teaching staff. So we established this rather informal group to make sure that we're able to quickly move and take initiative when initiative is needed and coordinate our activities among the teaching staff. And it proved to be quite uh, an important solution later on. What was also important in the first stage, uh, or rather awareness, since we were all in isolation, our teaching staff uh, were basically teaching uh, in their home offices, it was important that we collect information and we start planning and mapping up our benchmark for preparing for the autumn semester. It was important because our institute is one of the most internationalized institutes uh, at the University of Tartu. We knew that there will be quite a significant number of students who won't be able to come to University of Tartu and, and start uh, studying in our institute, and we wanted to make sure that we are able to facilitate that. Besides, also university clearly communicated that we need to deliver remote teaching for at least uh, two months at the start of the semester. So what we did is that we decided to collect feedback. There's also a QR code you can scan and have a look at uh, brief feedback there as well, that we collected from our teaching staff and we were mostly interested to hear uh, and collect some good teaching practices to understand what is the overall mood and to, in the next step, uh, organize collegial discussion. Luckily, the circumstances allowed us to do so. So we met together and we brainstormed about potential scenarios of reorganizing our teaching activities in a way how we, for example, plan our classes. Do we do hybrid classes? Do we pre-record classes? So it was, again, open for discussion among our teaching staff. 
On the basis of that, uh, what we did, we did next, we established the platform for all our teaching stuff and management in a Microsoft Teams environment called Digital Teaching at Schutte. And it was important because we felt that there is a lot of kind of flow of information that is very easy to get lost. So it's important to have one platform where we can exchange information, when we uh, can discuss the process of reorganization and communicate all the important information. And as a result of the collegial discussion, we also asked our teaching staff to follow up with scenarios of, okay, what exactly, how do you plan your teaching activities in the autumn semester? And on the basis of that, we individually followed up to every single scenario, evaluating both didactics, but also technical components. If you would like to deliver a hybrid classroom, have you already thought through how exactly you will do it uh, in terms of recording lectures, in terms of infrastructure, how to make sure that students who are sitting in class and joining online are able to participate more or less on equal terms? So things like that. We actually, I believe, sent out quite many emails during this time. And in the next st uh, stage, uh, integration, it was equally important not to forget about the ICT infrastructure that we have in place. Um, it was important to make sure that we are actually able to implement these teaching scenarios that we talked about. And the first thing that we did is to organize the technical audit of all our learning spaces to see how exactly it fits what we already sketched with the teaching stuff. Uh, and evaluate the, the readiness. So it was important for us at this stage to make sure that technology is not simply there uh, to be present, but it actually is aligned with our teaching scenarios, that it's easy to use for the teaching stuff, and um, it facilitates, most importantly, teaching and learning process. And in the fourth stage, Finally, uh, we are talking about the quality standards. Apologies. At this stage, it was important for us not to forget about the quality assurance. As we started reorganize, uh, reorganizing teaching, it was important that we also are able to control <laughs> uh, the quality when it comes to online classrooms. So in this regard, we developed the code of conduct, uh, which is a tool for teaching staff, but also for students to regulate basically how students are able to interact in the classrooms. And we also uh, developed the um, Moodle evaluation uh, baseline. What does it mean? Well, it means that we wanted to make sure that all courses that we are going to reorganize follow kind of a quality checklist, that they're coherent, and when students are going to join the courses, they're able to easily find information, and it looks coherent across the board. Uh, this information was disseminated to our teaching staff, and on the basis of that, again, we followed up individually to every single course. And in this uh, final stage, we also trained our teaching assistants. So, um, as we know, online, or rather remote emergency teaching took a lot of time, a lot of planning, and nerves, frankly, from teaching staff. So it was important to make sure that there are also teaching assistants who can perhaps take a little bit of a burden to make sure that the technical uh, aspects of the reorganization are facilitated, etc. So we trained teaching assistants to also readjust to these new circumstances. And finally, in the fifth stage, leadership is the process of monitoring. As we re-equipped our classrooms, it was important for us to make sure that the teaching staff also feels comfortable in this new environment. So we debriefed them about 
new technologies in the class. We made sure that we are the first responders. Uh, if something goes wrong, we are on high alert to come and help and to debrief them. And of course, we have developed the manuals and guidelines how to use this new technology. And we were in constant um, feedback mode with the teaching staff, with teaching assistants and students. In the final stage, innovation, it's a process of looking at this whole process in retrospect, looking how can we even more improve the quality and these processes. Uh, can we improve some of the manuals and guidelines that we have developed, or perhaps something else could be done better? And we, again, organized our collegial discussion, conducted uh, extensive surveys among the teaching staff, among the students, among the teaching assistants, and uh, on the basis of this feedback, re-evaluated our model. So, in short, it could be argued that the following process helped us to uh, improve uh, the human resources. We managed to retrain our teaching staff and teaching assistants to re-equip them with new digital skills, to refurbish our classrooms when it comes to ICT infrastructure, and we developed a plethora of training material for our uh, teachers, but also for management when it comes to retraining teaching staff and re organizing the processes, and we also managed to integrate new procedures and documentation when it comes to regulating this change. So just a few words about this model. How can it be applicable in other contexts? Um, well, I already mentioned this uh, framework of uh, DICOMP uh, EDU, developed by the European uh, Commission. And it also looks at the process uh, through six stages uh, when it comes to evaluation of digital competences. We believe that the practices that we followed could be somewhat reflected in the following approach. And um, basically what I would suggest that in order to reorganize the practices, start with the awareness stage, evaluate the need assessment of your stakeholders. You can do this through the surveys or collegial discussion. In the next stage, uh, when it comes to exploration, go a little bit more deeper. So follow up with uh, follow up questionnaires or forms when it comes to implementation scenarios, when it comes to teaching scenarios, uh, to have a better overview when it comes to teaching activities that would be um, reorganized and uh, make sure that there is a support group in place where teaching staff and management can communicate. In the process of integration, this is the process of execution. So now teaching staff equipped with the guidelines is able to act and readjust their courses and the management is able to upgrade their um, to upgrade the IT infrastructure in the stage of expertise it's all about the quality assurance so develop the guidelines that will help you to regulate the quality process and uh, also follow up with feedback to the teaching staff when it comes to this quality checklist that you also develop. And make sure that teaching assistants or support staff uh, are also able to deliver and readjust to the new environment. In the, leader in the leadership uh, stage, it's very important to monitor and keep the conversation and feedback in going. So, and in the process of innovation or the last stage, uh, it's important to reevaluate, to take a step back and look at the following approach in retrospect and see which practices could be reevaluated or improved. And just a final thought, perhaps why the following model worked in our case. Well, sure, it's very important to build and invest in the in-house infrastructure regardless of the emergency situation. Uh, basically, we did have the human resources, we did have some expertise and prior knowledge to quickly readjust and uh, to come up with this sort of process of reorganization. 
to some extent, I understand the second point can be a little bit controversial, but in our case, the decentralized structure did help because it helped us to quickly react and to have all these initiatives without waiting for too much time uh, approval from the central office, so to say. And it's also very important to build the trust among the teaching staff and management. I think uh, it was very important that we were on the same page. We could have laid out this very beautiful model and say, well, now you have to follow up all these uh, steps. But if teaching staff would say, well, that sounds fantastic, but why do we need to do that? Well most of the things that I talked about probably wouldn't be possible. So very early in the first stage of readjustment, we clearly communicated that we're on the same page. We want to help you. Uh, we want to make your life easier. And we were working all together. And finally, it's also possible to reimagine even old learning spaces. You don't have to move to the new building to deliver remote teaching. What is important is that technology facilitates uh, teaching and learning, most importantly, that this camera or microphone is there for a reason. So I think there's still a little bit of time for questions. Thank you for your attention. And I hope this was also useful and interesting for you. Thanks a lot, Anna, um, for that insight, how you're running things um, in Estonia. And that maybe um, brings me to my very first question already. Before I say it out loud, um, yes, dear audience, please use the chat. Uh, click on that little um, purple button on the right side of your screen. Open the chat window and send us your questions, and I'll make sure to pass them on to Anna. Um, how much of a base layer do you already need to work with um, uh, the model you described? Because as I said, and I, I said it jokingly, but I mean, there is a big truth to it. Estonia is quite far advanced. I know that you've also been teaching, I think, in Riga, um, in Lettland um, beforehand, uh, Latvia. And so those two countries, I think, have quite a good base layer of digitalization, meaning also the whole culture that comes with it amongst teaching staff and organizations. So could we take something like that? to Germany, or would we first have to do our homework, so to say? Thank you. This is a very legitimate question. Of course, uh, I think certain things we probably take for, for granted, like having a uh, very good, stable internet connection. You can go to the forest and connect. You know, there's a joke that Wi-Fi is growing in Estonia on the trees. Uh, but it, it is true. So something like this you take for granted. Uh, and in that regard, it was easier for us to tell to the teaching staff that, yes, you can connect, you can do certain things. Uh, but I think that um, it is possible. As I already mentioned, I think that the most important component uh, is human resources. Probably, I would even say, well, finances too, of course, but human resources and knowledge. I think that's the most important component. And willingness from the management and teaching staff to change. Because if you are not on the same page here, you can have overly enthusiastic teaching staff that wants to change, but the management that says, well, OK, sounds great, but maybe, you know, let's say, but let's wait for, 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 for a reason to do so. Um, so in this regard, I would say that it's important to start with this kind of common understanding among the teaching staff and management that we indeed need change, not because it's fancy, not because it's fashionable to talk about that, but it fits our kind of teaching philosophy. Uh, and, of course, developing digital infrastructure is important. I, I, but it's yeah. just uh, that's the other aspect. I mean, you're referring to the digital infrastructure, of course, here in Germany. Um, even here in the building, sometimes the Wi-Fi for me is too slow to actually see the slides <laughs> in a good <laughs> resolution. Um, but. Uh, and then in Estonia, you can do it in the woods. That's quite a big <laughs> difference. But I was also referring to as the cultural base yes. layer. Yes, of it course. It seems like if you have management and teachers on the same page already, you might be a big step ahead of most Certainly, and um, I think that uh, this is a very legitimate point that you're making, that uh, in this regard, people in, in Estonia, and I would say in the Baltics, have very high level of trust when it comes to technology. Uh, if you look at recent data of e-voting in Estonia, we had the local elections, 
around, I believe, 40% of people are voting online and things like that. Yes, indeed, we, we in some extent take for granted. But I still believe that, well, first of all, we have the, the, how should I say, we also have the EU, let's not forget about that. That's also a very good model for diffusing all these innovative practices. Actually, Estonia, uh, I believe when uh, we were hosting uh, EU presidency, you know, kind of pitched this idea that we should have the fifth freedom, freedom of data, you know. So I think that if we are socializing together, if we have events like this, uh, it allows new ideas to flourish and new teaching practices and innovation to, to diffuse. And maybe someone will say, well, okay, that sounds interesting. Maybe we should try it out. So I would say it's important to keep this open mind and kind of mm -hmm. mm, keep on pushing. <laughs> While we were discussing, we have the first two questions here in the chat. Um, let's see, Jens Tobor writes, in addition to new technologies in classrooms, is there a need to rethink the architecture of spaces so that they better fit hybrid formats? Mm -hmm. Jens, before Anna answers, stay in tune because one of our next talks will exactly focus on that topic, I think the last talk of today. So, but now your answer, Yes, Anna. absolutely. I, I completely uh, agree uh, with, with this comment that it's important to have also the, the architecture in place, of course. Uh, I believe that now all the new university buildings are actually already designed with this uh, mindset that it has to fit the, the, the teaching and learning activities. Uh, but let's say if you don't have that, it's also possible. We're actually, our institute is based in rather historical buildings. So, and uh, we had to play with some of the options that we we had with, with, with the existing infrastructure. So I think that the discussion about new learning spaces is very important, but uh, as I mentioned in, in the last point of my presentation, it's possible to reimagine even a simple traditional learning spaces. What is important is to uh, have a set of ideas, basically what kind of scenarios, teaching scenarios you plan to execute in this particular classroom, and then align them with the, with the learning spaces, but we that's briefly on, on this very Very briefly, <laughs> um, but the invitation also, Jens, please come back here half past five with um, the talk with Christian um, Kohls, who will also focus on specifically how to um, model new spaces. Um, so, um, coming to you, Steffen Probe, which recommendations would you give from your perspective to our upcoming new government to support first digitalization and second university teaching? You are half far ahead of us. So he ties a little bit into what we already spoke about. Um, yeah, what recommendations would you have for the new German government? Wow, that's a very big responsibility. <laughs> the world is uh, listening. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I think that, um, as I already mentioned, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating that, um, um, as I already mentioned, when it comes to flow, uh, free flow of data and exchange of data, that uh, it seems that sti still there are some gaps. So, of course, Estonia in this regard is a bit ahead of the curve. Uh, and um, certain initiatives are already been there in place. Uh, but, well, again, I would say that it's important to Perhaps, as I mentioned in, in, in our model, first of all, start with the need assessment and involve all relevant stakeholders in the conversation. The university, the private sector. I would also say that in Estonia, actually, there is quite, uh, well, basically, universities and private sectors are collaborating quite extensively on these terms. So it's important to take into account these various stakeholders and understand their perspective and understand their uh, needs and suggestions and uh, perhaps to, to start with that. But I would also say that uh, on the higher, again, EU level, there's a there's, uh, much higher need for uh, bigger collaboration, unfortunately, mm. when it comes to uh, digitalization. So my hope that, uh, again, Germany and Estonia will continue collaborating and exchanging the good practices. And we also have the e-governance uh, institute in Estonia that works specifically when it comes to suggestions to... We'll send a learning delegation to Estonia soon. We as will soon be as very as happy to host you, before. yes. <laughs> Anna, thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank I, I